you with that. The reason why I had to show you those photos is that so we're not talking about war in the abstract. So when we talk about war and describe war, um, one's necessarily limited by your the power of your words to portray that, but it's good for us to see those photos and see what happens in war. So we keep um, those images in the mind as we engage in the discussion. Why is this important now? As you saw in the slide, because there's a big war happening as we speak, war that, a war that has gripped the um, anxiety of human beings all over the world. It's going on in Ukraine. The horrors of that war are all too apparent when we watch the news every day. Devastation, civilian tenement buildings flattened, and it's not over yet, it continues. But we also know that that's not the first time that kind of thing has happened. We've seen a third movie before as Taylor Swift will sing in a song. And when we think back on it, we find that as much as horrifying as wars are, they've also provided opportunities for the international relations, international law, to do something about that kind of condition so that the world is improved after that war from the lessons learned from it. And that goes back to, shall we say, if we want to draw a long bow to tell the story, we'll go back to the um, 80 years war that uh, was fought in Europe from 1568 to 1648. And the 30 years war, they were also fought, they met the 80 years war, the 30 years war from 1618 to 1648. The 80 years war had to do with the Dutch um, war of independence, the Netherlands fighting to shake off the um, um, colonial domination of Spain. At the time, Spain was a powerful country and had all kinds of colonies, and the Netherlands uh, was one of the colonies of, uh, of Spain. So uh, the, the, the Dutch wanted them off. So the, the, that's the story of the 80 years war. So that started. The 30 years war, more complicated than that, uh, began with religious, uh, mid reformation, uh, and so on and so forth. Other things joined in much more, uh, you know, fight for territorial acquisition, expansion, and all that got mixed in it. It's a very complicated story, the 30 years war. But in 1648, everyone was exhausted. Now they wanted to, okay, let's, let's stop fighting. Let's try and uh, figure out how we end this thing. And that resulted in what, um, when you study international relations, international, or even economics, you would have heard about the peace of Westphalia. That was a, a peace that was concluded in 1648 in two, country, uh, two cities in, in, in Germany, um, Osnabrück and um, um, Munster, the two cities, um, the peace talks held simultaneously there. And eventually they agreed. As they were holding the conference to, to, to settle that war, the war was still going on, by the way. But then the, the peace conference um, concluded in 1648, and we had that treaty you called the Peace of Westphalia, 1648. And in it, uh, international relations experts give credit to that development as um, the basis of some of the norms we still recognize today in international relations, the idea of sovereignty of nations, that each country um, has the right to determine for itself what it wants without external interference. That resulted from the 
uh, piece of Westphalia because uh, the Holy Roman Empire is a complicated story. The Holy Roman Empire um, who used to run things, but the piece of Westphalia now started telling everyone, Holy Roman Empire, okay, no more. You're not going to be running, uh, uh, calling the shots for the different uh, principalities and kingdoms within the, the empire. So that's the concept of uh, sovereignty of a state where it started. But that's not the only thing that the Peace of Westphalia uh, did. Uh, the idea you were aware now, this is the economic summit. Um, people who, when you read the Peace of Westphalia, it's easy to glide past a lot of things that it says. It's written in very targeted language. But in it, you also find the idea of free trade, uh, you know, economic zones. We, I don't want to talk about Brexit, but you know what I'm talking about there. So that's also something you can give a piece of Australia credit for, the idea of protection of religious minorities. You would find it in that treaty as well. So these are concepts we still recognize today in international relations came about from peace of Westphalia uh, at the end of drawn out armed conflict. Move forward to 1853, the Crimean War started, uh, ended in 1856. Uh, that too gave the international uh, community international relations something beyond Florence Nightingale, whom some of you would have heard of that revolutionized uh, the, the profession of nursing and care for uh, wounded soldiers during a conflict. Uh, that was something uh, Florence Nightingale, the legend of Florence Nightingale came out of uh, the Crimean War. Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, the uh, Charge of the Light Brigade on what the Light Brigade was there a man dismayed? No, though the soldier knew that someone had blundered. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why that's but to do and die into the valley of death, wrote the 600. That's a verse from Alfred Lord Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, that story came, or that poem, came out of the Crimean War, the Battle of Balaclava. But beyond the poem, beyond the um, story of Florence Nightingale, and by the way, there's another nurse that doesn't get mentioned as much, but should. Mary Seacole, S-E-A-C-O-L-E. Mary Seacole was a Jamaican nurse who also worked in the um, Crimean War, was in London and then um, from here to, to, to there to help out. Uh, so beyond the stories of, of the nursing and poetry, the Crimean War gave the international community something we call the Paris Declaration of 1856. The Paris Declaration of 1856 was an international instrument that told states during war, um, you have to um, recognize the neutrality of countries who are not fighting that war, leave them alone to do their training. It also recognized the idea of formally uh, banishing privateering during war. Privateering, what is that? Privateering, every, all of us here, we've heard about pirates. Uh, privateers were basically pirates during war, but pirates are sanctioned by states. So you have one country fighting and the sovereign, uh, sovereign of one country will then authorize the, a pirate, somebody who would ordinarily be a pirate, you can go ahead and do your business, but if you the authority to do that, you do it in my name, harass the shipping of uh, my opponents fighting this war uh, with me, uh, you know, merchant mariners and the Navy, uh, go ahead and plunder them and uh, you do it in my name. So that is privateering. So the Paris Peace, uh, sorry, the Paris Declaration of 1856 
again, formally put a stop to, to that sort of thing. So it came out of, again, a war. Fast, fast forward to um, 1859, there was another war, the second Italian War of Independence, um, 1859. Before that time, I mean, Italy was not this united country that we know today until 1870, uh, the peninsula was an agglomeration of you know, different kingdoms, different principalities, uh, different duchies and um, you know, marquisates and all that. There's so many of them. So, but then um, the big one uh, in, the, uh, in the group would be the kingdom of um, Piedmont Sardinia, Piedmont, Sardinia, in Piedmont in the north uh, west part of uh, Italy, and then the Sardinia, the island directly below it. So that was a big kingdom, and it had many others. So the Piedmont, Sardinia led this uh, revolt to throw off the hegemony of Austria, the Austrian Empire, who at the time was a dominant power in, in the region, a powerful state in Europe at the time. So that, that war of independence started, and then um, there was a fast war of independence, not of interest to us, but we're more interested in the, the second one of 1859, June 1859, uh, 4th of June, 24th of June 1859. Was that epic, or rather, uh, epic in the sense, it wasn't epic, it was too long, it was only for, for a day the one of um, 24th of June, 1859. But a famous battle in there was the Battle of Solferino. The Battle of Solferino. That battle gave uh, the impetus for the creation of an institution that we all know today, the Red Cross, resulted from that Battle of Solferino. And the Red Cross has had different names over the years, but effect effectively came out of um, it, it, that, that battle. Because of the Swiss gentleman, Henri Delon, who witnessed that battle. And at the end of the battle, about between 30 to 40,000 uh, soldiers from both sides of it um, lay dead or wounded. And those who were wounded but could have been cared for and survived, but didn't get the care they needed, died. So when he came back his, to Switzerland, Henri Dunant, he wrote a famous book called En Souvenir de Solferino. It's a memory of Solferino, uh, that he, where he told the story of what he witnessed and then urged for things to be done. So that sort of thing that wouldn't keep happening, that's caring for wounded soldiers in the field uh, of battle. So that was the story of Red Cross, how it was formed, as I said, different names. But ultimately, um, Red Cross now helped to inspire the drafting of what we now know as the Geneva Conventions, 1948, and it was amended in 1977 to, again, uh, protect vulnerable people during war. That, again, came out of an armed conflict. And you had, excuse me, something in my, um, uh, st still stories of war, 1919, the famous war um, was concluded, the, the First World War from 1914 to 1918, excuse me. Um, 1914 to 1918, the First World War fought and concluded. And in 1919, um, an international conference held in Paris to settle the, you know, the circumstances of that war, clean things up, um, redraw the map of Europe. Um, so that happened in 1919. Something else happened in 1919 the creation of the League of Nations, the first time that the international community uh, put together the idea of 
a permanent international organization, the aim of which, or the purpose of which, is to um, try and save the world from fighting wars. So that's the primary uh, purpose of the League of Nations of, uh, that was created in 1920, of course, uh, you know, 1919, 1920. So that's something that came out of an armed conflict, a war. And together with the creation of the League of Nations came the idea of maybe it may be a good idea to have an international court that will try people who fight wars of aggression as well as who commit war crimes when they fight. Now, the difference between crimes of aggression and war crimes, and by the way, when, the, um, um, when I was being introduced, the, the, the jurisdictions of the ICC mentioned that's one crime that was omitted, I'm sure, by accident, was a crime of aggression. So classic international crimes, as we speak today, would be genocide, Wars, uh, war crimes, there's genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, the third one, and the crime of aggression, so in any order you can place them. So crime of aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, so that be the four international crimes. So they, but in 1919, the idea uh, came about that maybe it would be a good idea to have an international court to try uh, people who commit these crimes, war crimes and the crime of aggression. It wasn't discussed in the context of we're setting a permanent court to do that for all times. It was discussed in the context of we need to establish an international tribunal to try the Kaiser of Germany for war crimes or the crime of aggression. It didn't work, but the genie was out of the bottle from then on and it became something people said you know, thinking about this needs to happen. But um, perhaps as importantly, or even more importantly, was the idea that in such a court or such a tribunal, you could actually prosecute the head of state, the sovereign of a country like the Kaiser of Germany was, the emperor of Germany, king of Prussia, who was the idea was to prosecute him before that international tribunal. So the, it came about um, as um, a notion that came out of um, a war. And in 1945, that notion clinched. After the Second World War, another war, uh, the tribunal at Nuremberg was established that actually prosecuted the surviving members of the Third Reich, uh, the, you know, sorry of Hitler who um, offed himself as the war was coming to an end. Uh, but uh, he was survived, or rather um, um, succeeded for a brief period by Grand Admiral um, Karl Dönitz, D-O-N-I-T-Z. So he was the uh, head of state of Germany for a period. Um, after Hitler died until they surrendered to, to, to the Allies. And Dönitz and all the surviving members of the Third Reich, top hierarchy, the topmost two were still alive, were prosecuted by the Nuremberg Tribunal. Over in the Far East, the same thing happened. The surviving members of the Japanese uh, imperial cabinet were all prosecuted, including the prime minister surviving. The only one who was paired was the emperor Hirohito, not because of respect for his sovereignty, but people have different theories about why uh, political arguments, um, those political scientists would say why he was paired because Americans needed him to be able to uh, run Japan immediately after the war. So if they also embarrassed their, uh, you know, uh, 
Japanese people by prosecuting their emperor. That would make Japan ungovernable. So it wasn't because he was spared, not because of respect for his sovereignty, but out of political consideration, some would say. But then um, lawyers would also say, but actually that would make sense in a way that he wasn't prosecuted because if we accept the idea that sovereigns, uh, you have prime minister and you have sovereigns who are most, who mostly uh, reigned but didn't rule, then uh, it will be difficult to prove their responsibility for uh, the crime. So the point is to say that the surviving members of the Japanese imperial cabinet were prosecuted uh, also uh, after the Second World War. So again, these are all developments that came about improvements of inter in international law, international relations that resulted from armed conflict. The Nuremberg Tribunal's work and the Tokyo Tribunal's work were um, solid precedents that are often cited for uh, latter-day developments like what we now have in The Hague, where I used to work, the International Criminal Court. Uh, we would always point to Nuremberg Tribunal, to Tokyo Tribunal, as the precedents that showed that it was possible and correct and lawful to do this. So these are developments that came out of war. So having said that stage, taking long to do that, at least I wanted to get a picture of where this is going, where we will now say, ask ourselves, is it possible for something like that to come out of the war in Ukraine after we're all done crying about it? As we should. So that's the question. And I say yes, it is possible if we all want to make it happen. And making it happen uh, is not for somebody else, it's for you, me, me, each one of us who would have a voice in how we want our world to be, to help encourage that development. And what is it I'm talking about? the right to peace. We saw the devastation in the images. That's why I showed you those photos. Now, um, I did not show you photos of, uh, you know, bombings that happened in, in, in London at the time of England during the Second World War. There were bombing raids and also devastations, but the point was that the idea of relaxing and enjoying uh, the place where you are and what that place has to offer. Education, here we are, here gathered peacefully, discussing stuff. Uh, we'll go shopping and all that. People in Ukraine don't do that. People in Dresden didn't do that. People in London at the time were hunkering in bunkers when there were air raid sirens. People in Syria are not having that. In Yemen, you don't have that. But we're having it here. We have it in Canada and the USA. Because we're enjoying peace. Peace makes it possible. Peace makes the, your profession as economists of the future, and I understand many lawyers to be in the room. Uh, easy for us to practice. If you haven't got peace, you can't do these things. Now, why is it important? After the Second World War, I told you about the um, Nuremberg Tribunal and how it helped to set the stage for the ICC. One more very important thing that happened after the Second World War was the idea of fundamental human rights took hold for the first time after the Second World War. We had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted. Uh, we, from then on, we had the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights adopted. We had the Covenant on Social and Economic Rights adopted. 
In fact, we have had, we now have conventions on the right of the child, um, convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, convention on the elimination of discrimination against women, um, rights of people with disabilities. These are all you know, the instruments of human rights that started after the Second World War, the idea of the idea of human rights sort of after the Second World War. In the uh, covenant on um, civil and political rights, for instance, one of the famous ones would be your right uh, to freedom of assembly, um, your right to the uh, protection of your person, your right to freedom of speech, and many others. Now you ask yourself, which one of these rights can you really meaningfully enjoy in circumstances of absence of peace? Which fundamental human right can you meaningfully enjoy when you haven't got peace in the place? None, I would say. So, and then you say, okay, what about peace? Shouldn't that be the most fundamental of human rights from which all these other ones spring? But there is no fundamental right to peace as we speak. There is, international law hasn't grown to recognize that, national relations. And I say it's about time that happens. And let that be perhaps one of the things the war in Ukraine can give us. Now, beyond the normative uh, value that that kind of development can have for its own sake, there are also practical values that come out of it. And what is that? Okay, If you have the right to peace, uh, it means, or any right at all, there is a correlative obligation on the person who violates that right. To make amends when they violate, because they violated that right. So you can go to court and sue someone who has violated your fundamental human right to security of the person. If you have evidence of what they've done, you sued that person, of course, the prosecutor can also prosecute the person for, you know, assault, occasioning serious bodily harm, or if some uh, relative, attempted murder, uh, rape, and all that. Um, so the prosecutor can prosecute people who do that. But also the victims of that um, kind of conduct have their own right and ability to the prosecutor, thank you very much for the prosecution. I appreciate it very, very much. And that person ought to go to jail for what they've done. But I also want to sue them in my own. So I'm going to hire my own lawyer, retain my own solicitor or barrister to commit lawsuits because this person has some money somewhere. And it should not be right that after he finishes serving his sentence, he comes out to go and enjoy his wealth. Because I live with the um, burdens of what this person has done for the rest of my life, I want to get some compensation out of him. So that's how you have the civil remedy that comes from criminal conduct. And this is what the right to peace would do if you accepted it and uh, give it that value. It means in the different countries that have ratified this instrument, if we have a treaty that says that in each of these countries, 
you can have victims of violation of that right to peace, commence legal proceedings, despite what the ICC does. Uh, people can come here in the UK, Ukrainian, for instance, assuming we had this um, in place already, Ukrainians can come to the UK, um, retain solicitors and barristers and say, look, uh, I have been, like, life in Ukraine has been destroyed, right? but this person who did that has assets in the UK that want the UK courts to judge my claim, and if it is proved that I have a claim, I want to attach those assets in the UK. If you did that, and many countries do that, it will make heads of state, powerful heads of state, who think that I have the big weapons to launch armed conflict, they will think more carefully next time. Thank you very much. Um, what a moving and inspiring speech that was, and thank you so much for sharing your experience as what you've done in the International Criminal Court and all the incredible work that you've undertaken during your time there. So as this is the last day of the summit, I really encourage everyone to fully engage with the Q&A session, and there'll be plenty of opportunities to do that today, so let's get right onto it. Uh, I'll be taking in-person questions, so just raise your hand up if you have anything to ask, and I'll get the mic to you. Yes. Okay, um, hello, uh, my name is Valeria. I'm studying at Webster Vienna University. And um, my question is, so Putin uses the language of special military, military operation and not declared still a war. And in order to hold him and other war criminals accountable, uh, the war has to be declared and it has to, the war has to have the name, and uh, but it's not a special military operation, it's a full-scale war. So despite the usage of this uh, language uh, and trying to escape responsibility, uh, it is a fact, a full-scale war. So what could we do about this dissonance of the use of uh, language and how can we hold work renewables accountable because Nuremberg trials were the first presidents in the history uh, but it was only possible after the war was over and um, uh, the prosecution of Russian uh, criminals could be possible under the circumstances when the when Ukraine would win the war, and is there any chance to reform the system under which um, military war criminals will be prosecuted, no matter of the usage of language, and not waiting until the war is over? Uh, because we live in 21st century, and uh, maybe it's time to have the new president, uh, president uh, that, as we had uh, in Nuremberg trials. And um, so this would grant uh, some possibility for the world peace, uh, that other global actors would know that they would be held accountable, no matter of what they do, they would always still be prosecuted and accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take that question. Very important. Uh, it's a brilliant question. It captures a number of themes that are important to, to know and that are actually uh, ongoing in the discussions as we speak. First of all, um, the idea that um, you can call something something else um, doesn't work. Uh, in law, those of the law students in the room and those of you who may study law later, there is a saying about equity. They say equity looks at substance and not form. 
so you can try and disguise things, but the, it is the essence of the thing that matters. Uh, international law is actually on the same page as equity on that issue. And specifically on the subject of the um, ground of aggression, uh, it doesn't matter what you call what you're doing. And yes, international law requires, or rather, I don't want to say requires, there was a time when it was the um, um, going understanding that the war has to be quote unquote declared. International law has moved on from that understanding to now. You don't have to declare a war. As long as you're fighting a war, international law recognizes that a war is going on, whether or not you've declared it. Similarly, in relation to the crime of aggression, uh, in 1974, the United Nations General Assembly, in an instrument called UN Resolution 3314, UN General Assembly Resolution 3314, bracket 29, in Roman numerals XXIX bracket. 3314 bracket XXIX, can you Google it? Uh, was a resolution of the UN General Assembly that uh, set out the elements of acts of aggression. So you, any of those things, say, right, would amount to an act of aggression, whether or not it is called that by whoever is impact on uh, engaged in those contacts. Effectively, uh, to sum it all up, it is basically the action of striking fast against one state, striking out fast against another. When that striking out fast was not inspired by immediate need of self-defense in the sense that somebody is about to attack you and you know that this person is about to attack you and you have no moment for deliberation, the only choice you have to do is to strike to defend yourself. So if that's not the equation, if that's not what's going on, striking first is an act of aggression, roughly speaking. I mean, you can get more nuanced, so you can sharpen the understanding better than that. But so, move it to Ukraine. Clearly, there was no imminent act of self defense involved in that so called special military operation. So, uh, you can call it special military operation, it is an act of aggression. So, there is no question about that. So, uh, that's not uh, what really an issue. And about so that, you, that need not worry you. So the fact that it was called special military operation, it doesn't stop it being an act of aggression. It is a war of aggression. Now, moving past that, could you prosecute um, someone who is in power? Yes, you can prosecute. So international law does not require that the only time uh, prosecution may happen is upon conclusion of an ongoing war. No, the prosecution can happen if possible as the conduct um, is ongoing. The difficulty about that is all too apparent, of course, if an ongoing war is so is it easy to collect the evidence and uh, so that the problem will be more practical than normative. So the international law does not require a conclusion of that armed conflict before um, prosecution can, can start. The difficulty, so uh, I can complete the discussion since it raised. The problem we do have now with um, aggression in Ukraine, prosecuting it, was because of a certain politics that happened in relation to the crime of aggression when it was being recognized in the Rome Statute. Remember that I mentioned four crimes, uh, international crimes. The other three don't have this problem, genocide, um, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Uh, we not have this problem going to describe next. And in the sense that those three crimes 
if they are committed in the territory or on the territory of a member state of the Rome Statute, the ICC has jurisdiction over that, notwithstanding that who is committing that crime on the territory of a member state, the um, assailant is not a member state of the Rome Statute. Maybe an, I want to be a member of the ICC, but then you're doing something that is amounting to war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, on the territory of a member state of the Rome Statute, ICC has jurisdiction because we're doing something in the territory of a member state of the Rome Statute. That's not the case with aggression. And that's what, where this politics is um, problematic. So to say, well, the way it was negotiated, the powerful countries who had the minds to fight the assault force tried somehow to um, push aggression off. Um, and so, no, 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 we, we, we're not going to allow the ICC to have an independent jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, because usually the crime of aggression is something that's ordered by the head of state or top military leaders of a country. So it's a special crime. Because it's a special crime, we are going to say that it's only the Security Council that should authorize the ICC to have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So the state parties who are negotiating that resisted that push of giving the UN Security Council the authority to green light prosecution of the crime of aggression in all cases. So when they failed in that attempt, then they resulted to a more compromised position. So all right, ICC can prosecute the crime of aggression, but not when it is committed either on the territory or by a national of a state that is not a state party to the Rome Statute, except if the Security Council authorizes it. The reason for the Security Council is because there are some five countries in the Security Council that have uh, the veto power. So if they say no, Security Council cannot do anything on that, and the five countries including Russia, China, US, UK, France, in there. So now you have that gap in the Rome Statute that said that ICC could not prosecute the crime of aggression in the Rome uh, Statute if it is committed on the territory or if it's committed by a national of a state that is not a party to the Rome Statute and Russia is not a party to the Rome Statute except if the Security Council authorizes it, but Security Council will not authorize it because Russia will veto that authorization. So you now have that gap in relation to aggression, but countries are now, there's a movement now to try and create a special tribunal just for the crime of aggression in Ukraine because it cannot be prosecuted now at the ICC. The ICC can't prosecute the other three, but not aggression. So there's a movement now to create a special tribunal for the crime of aggression in Ukraine. Now, it's a long story, but I just wanted to give you a um, general picture. So at least you're part of the discussion when you uh, read about it. You probably will have this in the back of your mind, the explanation. I'll leave it there. There are many compli uh, complexities to that story that can keep us here for another seminar, but we'll, we'll not go into those details. Thank you so much for that very elaborate answer. I'll be taking one more question. And can I please ask that you keep your questions brief? Um, yes. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. One second. Thank you. What measures do you think we can take in order to improve and strengthen the ICJ so that uh, the war crimes of even stronger nations are acknowledged and addressed, considering the unaddressed war crimes of certain more powerful nations, for example, the civilian drone strikes in Pakistan and Afghanistan? Um, include uh, the ICC, you mean? I mean of so course. The ICC, I understood the question, but the difference between the ICC and the ICJ. The, there's another court called the International Court of Justice that the ICJ. ICJ does not um, deal with prosecution of individuals. ICJ jurisdiction has to do with when two countries are arguing or disputing about something. So that's the ICJ. But you cannot, you don't do prosecution there. 
it is the ICC. That's where the prosecution is done. ICC does individual criminal responsibility. So that's your question. How, what measures can be taken to improve the ICC from this perspective? There are measures that can be taken. Uh, first of all, one of them, as uh, indicated in my answer to the first question, would be to amend the Rome Statutes to remove fact impediment to the prosecution of the crime of aggression in the circumstances that I have described. Uh, and that uh, discussion is ongoing now. Say so you no longer, you basically you bring aggression into the same boat with the other three crimes. So that when a non-state party to the Rome Statute is engaged in a crime of aggression on the territory of a member state, ICC should have jurisdiction without the Security Council's involvement. So that's one uh, amendment that can happen to the Rome Statute. A second amendment that can happen to the Rome Session that goes to your question about Syria and other places is there is also a provision in the Rome Statute, I think it's Article 15 or 13b, 13b of the Rome Statute that uh, gives the Security Council the authority to refer a case to the ICC, any case of the ICC, including a country that's not a member state of the ICC. If the Security Council refers that country to the ICC, ICC has jurisdiction. Otherwise, ICC's jurisdiction is limited to uh, what happens in the territory or concerns citizens of member states. But if Security Council refers a situation to the ICC, as happened with Libya, so ICC will have jurisdiction. Libya is not a member state of the Rome Statute, but ICC has jurisdiction because Security Council referred a question. The problem that Security Council is the only um, authority in the UN given uh, the only organ of the UN that's given that authority. And we also know that the reason why Syria, for instance, has not been referred to the ICC is because Russia and China were exercising veto power over any move to refer uh, Syria to the ICC. So still you have that problem of veto power uh, hamstringing the Security Council from referring cases to the ICC. One way you can solve that is if you expanded the um, organs of the UN that can refer cases to the ICC, that may help to attenuate that problem. It may not you know, solve it completely, but it can attenuate it in the sense that if you allowed now, if you added in addition to the Security Council, if the General Assembly of the UN is also given the right to refer cases to the ICC, it means when the Security Council doesn't refer it because somebody is using veto power to stop it, the General Assembly can vote and adopt a resolution and send the case to the ICC. But that, we don't, we're not there yet. But if that adjustment is made, at least it will help to um, attenuate that difficulty. Um, and with that perceptive answer, I believe we'll have to conclude our Q&A session for today. A big, big thank you to Judge Hele Ibori uh, Usuji, who has flown all the way from Canada to be with us all today. And so thank you so much for your time and your words. And can we please get another big round of applause? <laughs>